Hello everyone, my name is Mary Comer and I'm a trustee of the Society of the Friends of the Parish Church of St Cuthbert's in Edinburgh. On behalf of the Friends, I'm delighted to talk to you about Agatha Christie and her mysterious connection with St Cuthbert's, dating from 1930. But first of all, let's take a look at Agatha's life up until 1930. Agatha Miller was born on 15th September 1890 into a wealthy upper middle class family in Ashfield, Torquay, Devon. Her father was American and travelled a lot for his business. Her mother was born in Belfast. She had one elder sister, Margaret, and one elder brother, Louis. Agatha always described her childhood as very happy. Unlike her siblings, she was not sent to boarding schools abroad, but was educated at home by her parents. She was a voracious reader from an early age. She spent most of her childhood apart from other children, which probably helped to develop her imagination. At the age of 10, she wrote her first poem. Agatha met Archibald Christie at a dance given by Lord and Lady Clifford at Ugbrook, about 12 miles from Torquay. Archie was born in India, the son of a barrister in the Indian Civil Service. He was an army officer who was seconded to the Royal Flying Corps in 1913. The couple quickly fell in love. Upon learning that he would be stationed in Farnborough, Archie proposed marriage and Agatha accepted. With the outbreak of the First World War in August 1914, Archie was sent to France to fight. They married on the afternoon of Christmas Eve 1914 at Emmanuel Church in Bristol, which was close to the home of his parents while Archie was on home leave. Rising through the ranks, he was eventually stationed back to Britain in September 1918 as a colonel in the Air Ministry. Agatha involved herself in the war effort too. After joining the Voluntary Aid Detachment in 1914, she attended to wounded soldiers at a hospital in Torquay as a nurse. She performed 3,400 hours of unpaid work between October 1914 and December 1916. On qualifying as an apothecary's assistant in 1917 and working as a dispenser, she earned £16 a year until the end of her service in September 1918. Nowadays, of course, Agatha Christie is very well known and recognised all over the world. However, her literary career was slow to take off as no one originally wanted to publish her short stories. Her life changed rapidly during the time she served as a nurse, tending to troops coming back from the trenches. During that time, she met a man who was apparently hardly more than five feet tall. His head was exactly the shape of an egg and his moustache was very stiff and military. The man was from Belgium and in him, Agatha had found Mr. Hercule Poirot, her most famous character. The first novel featuring the Belgian detective, The Mysterious Affair at Stiles, was written in 1916 and first published in the US in 1920 and in the UK in 1921. It was a huge success and Agatha Christie was launched. After the war, Agatha and Archie Christie settled in a flat at 5 Northwick Terrace in St John's Wood, London. Agatha gave birth to her only child, Rosalind Margaret Hicks, in August 1919 at Ashfield, where the couple spent much of their time having few friends in London. Archie left the Air Force at the end of the war and started working in the city, while Agatha published further novels and short stories. In order to tour the world promoting the British Empire exhibition, the couple left their daughter Rosalind with Agatha's mother and sister. They travelled to South Africa, Australia, New Zealand and Hawaii. In late 1926, Archie asked Agatha for a divorce. He'd fallen in love with Nancy Neal, who had been a friend of Major Belcher, director of the British Empire mission, on the promotional tour a few years earlier. On 3rd December 1926, the Christies quarrelled and Archie left their house in Berkshire to spend the weekend with Nancy in Surrey. At around 9.45pm, Agatha disappeared from her home. 
leaving behind a letter for her secretary saying that she was going to Yorkshire. Her car, a Morris Cowley, was found at Newlands Corner in Surrey, perched above a chalk quarry with an expired driving licence and clothes. The disappearance caused a public outcry. The Home Secretary pressured police and a newspaper offered a £100 reward. Over a thousand police officers, 15,000 volunteers and several aeroplanes scoured the landscape. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle gave a spirit medium one of Agatha's gloves to find her. Crime novelist Dorothy L. Sayers visited the house in Surrey and used the scenario in her book, Unnatural Death. Agatha's disappearance was featured on the front page of the New York Times. Despite the extensive manhunt, she was not found for 10 days. On 14th December 1926, she was found at the Swan Hydropathic Hotel in Harrogate, registered as Mrs. Teresa Neal, the surname of her husband's lover, from Cape Town. Agatha's autobiography makes no reference to her disappearance. Two doctors diagnosed her as suffering from amnesia, yet opinion remains divided as to why she disappears. She was known to be in a depressed state from literary overwork, her mother's death earlier that year, and her husband's infidelity. Public reaction at the time was largely negative, suspecting a publicity stunt or an attempt to frame her husband for murder. The Christies were subsequently divorced, with Agatha retaining custody of her daughter and the Christie name for her writing. One of Agatha's lifelong ambitions had been to travel on the Orient Express, and her first journey took place in the autumn of 1928. Persuaded by a chance dinner party conversation, Agatha set off for Baghdad and from there travelled to the archaeological site at Ur, where she became friends with the Woolies, who ran the dig. Invited back the following year, she met the 25-year-old archaeologist in training, Max Mallowan, who was to become her second husband. Asked by Catherine Woolley to show Agatha the sites, each found the other's company relaxing. Their relationship was forged by travel. Max could rough it, and so could Agatha. Before we go into more detail about Agatha's marriage to Max, let's shift our attention to the parish church of St Cuthbert's in Edinburgh, and in particular, its famous memorial chapel. St Cuthbert's is a parish church of the Church of Scotland in central Edinburgh. Probably founded in the 7th century, the church once covered an extensive parish around the borough of Edinburgh. The memorial chapel is at the westernmost end of the church building. As you enter it, you are stepping out of the current building, which was completed in 1894, and into the base of the tower of the previous church, which was built in 1775. After new doorways in the north and south walls of the new church were created, this space fell into disuse. It was subsequently remodelled to the design of McGregor Chalmers as a memorial to those who died in the First World War. The space was consecrated as a chapel in 1921. The dedication of the chapel reads, To the glory of God and in memory of the men of St Cuthbert's who fell in the war 1914 to 1918, this chapel is dedicated. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. It is thought that this is on or very near the original site on which St Cuthbert, a 7th century monk, built his original hut on a journey from Melrose. This marked the beginning of Christian worship on this site. Here we can see the curved apse walls around the commun communion table, which are inlaid with beautiful gilt mosaic. The other walls of the chapel are covered with Swedish green marble slab panels. A small encased sloping support on the east wall bears the roll of honour, and on the wall panels are inscribed names of the 157 St Cuthbert's people who died during the First World War. The window in the north wall behind the communion table depicts Christ's crucifixion, which we remember on Good Friday each year. 
gathered around his cross are shown his mother, Mary, dressed in blue, and some of the other women who followed Jesus. Also the disciple John, recorded by the Bible writers as the only one of Jesus' disciples with the courage to be present at his crucifixion. The chapel also features small, beautifully decorated, ornate tiles in a variety of designs, inlaid into the marble below each list of names, and a beautiful plasterwork ceiling. The memorial chapel is special and very beautiful, but what were the circumstances that led Agatha Christie and her second husband-to-be to get married there in 1930? First, a little bit of background information about Max. Born in Wandsworth in 1904, Max was the son of Frederick Mallowan and his wife Marguerite, whose mother was mezzo-soprano Martha de Vivier. He was educated at Rokeby School and Lansing College, where he was a contemporary of Evelyn Waugh and studied classics at New College, Oxford. Max first worked as an apprentice to Leonard Woolley at the archaeological site of Ur from 1925 to 1931. As we know, it was at this site that he first met Agatha Christie. In 1932, after a short time working at Nineveh with Reginald Campbell Thompson, Max became a field director for a series of expeditions jointly run by the British Museum and the British School of Archaeology in Iraq. Following the outbreak of the Second World War, he served with the RAF Volunteer Reserve in North Africa and after the war, he was appointed Professor of Western Asiatic Archaeology at the University of London in 1947. Max was appointed Commander of the Order of the British Empire in the 1960 Queen's Birthday Honours and knighted in 1968. In 1971, Agatha was made a Dane for her contributions to literature. They became one of only a few married couples at the time who each of whom held knightly honours in their own right. Well, back to 1930, and Agatha went to great length to keep her second wedding a secret. Having endured a feverish interest in her activities after she briefly went missing in 1926, she was suspicious of the media for the rest of her life and wanted to avoid any publicity as she prepared to marry for the second time. In her autobiography, which was published after her death in 1976 at the age of 85, Agatha wrote, I had had so much publicity and been caused so much misery by it that I wanted things kept as quiet as possible. We agreed that Carlo and Mary Fisher, her friends, Rosalind, her daughter, and I should go to Skye and spend three weeks there. Our marriage bands could be called there and we would be married quietly in St Columba's Church in Edinburgh. I found Skye lovely. I did sometimes wish it wouldn't rain every day, though it was only a fine misty rain which didn't really count. We walked miles over the moor and the heather and there was a lovely soft earthy smell with a tang of peat in it. The days passed in Skye, my bands were duly read in church and all the old ladies sitting round beamed on me with the kindly pleasure that all old ladies take in something romantic. You will have noticed that Agatha called the church St Columba's Church in that passage, and this was one of several deliberately misleading statements connected to the wedding. Not only did that Agatha refer to an entirely different church, but she attempted to disguise the couple's age difference by giving her age on the marriage certificate as 37 rather than 39 while Max's was given as 31 rather than 26. The decision to change these ages came directly from Agatha's reservations about marrying again after the traumatic breakdown of her relationship with her first husband, Archie. In her autobiography, she said, I was so miserable, so uncertain, so confused. First, I decided that the last thing I wanted to do was marry again, that I must be safe from ever being hurt again and that nothing could be more stupid than to marry a man many years younger than myself. Then, imperceptibly, I found my arguments changing. It was true that he was much younger than I was, but we had so much in common. He was not fond of parties or a keen dancer. To keep up with a young man like that would have been very difficult for me. But surely I could walk around museums as well as anyone, 
and probably with more interest and intelligence than a younger woman. I could go around all the churches in, in Aleppo and enjoy it. I could listen to Max talking about the classics and I could learn the Greek alphabet. In fact, I could take far more interest in Max's archaeological work and his ideas than in any of Archie's deals in the city. Agatha spoke to countless friends and relatives, asked for their opinions and heard both sides of the argument before deciding to take the plunge. As the ceremony approached, the secrecy was maintained by Agatha and her friends. And if she had feared there might be any invasion of her privacy, all the clandestine arrangements reaped a positive result. Not even the most tenacious investigative journalist had a clue that it was happening. Her stay in Skye and serving of the bands in Broadford went unnoticed. Thus it was that the marriage ceremony took place on 11th September 1930, conducted by the Reverend George MacLeod, who later became the moderator of the General Assembly and founded the Iona community. Inside the church there is a copy of the marriage certificate, which declares, on 11th September 1930 at St Cuthbert's Church, Edinburgh, after bans according to the Church of Scotland, Max Edgar Lucian Mallowan, bachelor, aged 31, of Cornwall Gardens, London, the son of Frederick Mallowan, produce broker, and Marguerite Mallowan, maiden surname de Vivier, and Agatha Mary Clarissa Miller or Christie, aged 37, divorced from Colonel Archibald Christie. Agatha later wrote, our wedding was quite a triumph. There were no reporters there and no hint the secret had leaked out. Our duplicity continued because we parted at the church door. Max went back to London to finish his archaeological work on Ur for another three days, while I returned the next day with Rosalind to Cresswell Place. Max kept away, then two days later, he drove up to the door in a hired Daimler. We drove off to Dover and thence crossed the channel to the first stopping place of our honeymoon, which was Venice. The whole occasion may have been staged with a host of red herrings, and the couple might have been economical with the truth about their ages, but they were very happy and were subsequently together for the next 46 years. Indeed, Agatha joked about how she had forged an alliance with somebody who had the ideal vocation. She said the good thing about being married to an archaeologist is that the older you get, the more interested he becomes. One final note. In December 2017, the Society of the Friends of St Cuthbert's were able to persuade the official website, agathachristie.com, to amend its text officially identifying St Cuthbert's as the real church in which the marriage took place, thus clearing up the mystery surrounding the venue once and for all. St Cuthbert's has now become part of a nationwide Christie trail, with many fans visiting, often dressed in 1930s style ball gowns, Art Deco inspired clothing, or even Poirot outfits. Well, that's the end of my talk on Agatha Christie and her mysterious connection with St Cuthbert's. Thank you for listening and I hope you've enjoyed it. Goodbye.